Mm-hmm. All right, so today we're talking about human resources, HR, staff development. Has anybody worked for HR before? No, me either. I know about it though. I did. You did? Military. Are you working in HR? Military. Tell us about it. Military. Tell us about it. Do I really have to? Yeah. We want to know. <laughs> no, is that classified information? All right. You get a pass. Yes. <laughs> so what is human resources? Has to do with obviously recruitment, finding people, finding the right people, um, selecting the right people, making sure that you're paying them the right amount. Um, performance appraisals. After you recruited them and hired them, how are you evaluating what they're doing? Um, grievance handling and labor relations. Those are your main things within HR. What are their functions? Obviously staffing. Number one, key. Why is staffing so key? What is staffing related to? Waste. Waste. Mm-hmm. What else? Money. Right? Mm-hmm. Human capital. Uh, training and development. Motivation and maintenance. Maintenance meaning retention. How are we going to maintain these employees and keep them around? So why is motivation and satisfaction so important? You can just go hire somebody else, right? right. It doesn't matter if we motivate them. Or it doesn't matter. It yes. does matter. Why does it matter? There's plenty of people looking for a job right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so once you put all that money, money in a person, mm-hmm. you invest in Here we are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, My money girl. It's too <laughs> expensive, right? Yeah. It costs money to hire people. That them training hours add up. It costs <laughs> money to train people. You also had a good point. I don't say money too. I say it costs money to train them. Right. And develop them. And then you want to retain them after that. They're already experienced. Mm-hmm. So you want to keep them motivated. Right. And then you got all that time lost from not having people on the floor. And then you have a higher turnover rate. Right. You don't keep them. And, and you have to also board. remember that a lot of times how you treat your employees is going to reflect on uh, the patients that they're providing services for. So if you're uh, motivating the employees and engaging them, they're going to have a positive attitude that's going to be reflected on the patients. Now, if you're not motivating your employees, they're not satisfied, the employee morale is low, what do you think is going to happen to the patients? How are they going to be treated? Poor. Poor Poorly, right? Mm-hmm. Challenges. Obviously, there's some challenges in, in, in trying to hire people and, and keep people on the boat, keep people in line, uh, disciplining people. These are a few of the challenges that come with HR. You have all these laws that you have to follow that are always changing. Um, and these are all in addition to your policies that your own organization is going to have. So on top of your organizational rules and policies, you have to deal with labor laws. You can't say this in the interview. You can't do this. You can't fire somebody because of this. You have to be up on all of those policies and laws. What about unions? This is more, more relevant in other areas than some, but there's some areas that are highly unionized where if an upsurge were to happen with the union, the organization might crumble. Um, California, mm-hmm. at one point up in uh, Detroit where the, car, um, mm-hmm. the manufa- auto mm-hmm. manufacturing unions were a big deal. Um, competition. Did that a couple of years. How are we going to hire our LPNs and CNAs when they can go to Holiday Inn and make two more dollars an hour, right? So there's always going to be competition from, from other industries um, like hotels, fast food, other hospitals. What about workforce? How might that be a challenge? If you're an organization striving to have a diverse workforce and your hospital is in Fayetteville, North Carolina, how might that be a challenge? 
Yeah, we have a lot of diversity, especially ethnic backgrounds. Do you think it would be hard to recruit? People from diverse backgrounds in the yeah. area like this? No. 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 Easy. Mm -hmm. Easy. All right. Well, what if you had one uh, gender more than the other? What if you had a predominantly female yeah. workforce? Mm -hmm. <laughs> would it be hard to bring in a male? <laughs> <laughs> Men are working right now. Yeah. Is that diverse? Yes. No. 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 Not if you are predominantly yeah. female mm -hmm. workforce. Staffing levels. And we just talked about staffing a little bit and how important it is. And these are some of the, the, the main factors that your staffing level should be based on. Obviously, number one should be volume. You should not have 10 nurses if you only have two patients, right? <laughs> kind, of, kind of common sense, but we still need to, to make sure we've taken this into consideration. Waiting and skill mix. Those have to do with is um, while you might not need 10 nurses for two patients, you might need three. Why, why might you need three? In case one is out or in case one is, like, like I say, it's like off that day or in, in case of emergency, why it goes. Okay, what else? Why else might you need three nurses to two patients? Well, I mean, that, that, that you need assistance like, for anything with the patient? Yeah. And why might you need assistance? Um, um, they may need to be some medical to, thing or they Right. So waiting and skill mix have to do with the complexity of a patient's condition. You may have two very sick patients. And for that reason, you may need three, three nurses. You may need two of the nurses to be with the patient at all times, the third uh, nurse to you don't handle phone calls or referrals or whatever it may be. What if one of the two patients is very obese? You may need a two, pa a two nurse to one patient ratio. Uh, so, you know, waiting and skill mix are very important when you're trying to figure out what your staff level is. You may not always be able to match one person or one patient, or, or there may not be a formula um, that you can use to figure out what your, what your levels are. You may have to really sit down and think about what type of patients you have and how sick they are, how acute um, their condition is. And then distribution. Okay, um, once you've figured out how many uh, staffing people you're gonna have, how are you going to split them up? Are you going to have four nurses on this floor and three nurses on the other floor? Or you know, how are you gonna divide them up? Is it gonna be based on their skill level? Uh, do you wanna have uh, two of your skilled nurses on the same floor, or do you want to spread them out onto the different floors? So distribution kind of deals with, um, once you've figured out the number, how are you going to divide them up, and along with the duties. All right, so scheduling, almost just as important as, as staffing. They kind of go hand in hand. Um, you want to make sure, obviously, that all of your time slots are filled. I've seen situations where this did not happen, for one reason or another and someone had to be called in at the last minute to fill a slot that for whatever reason had not been filled. Um, you want to take into consideration days that people have put in for being out for vacation or if someone is sick or uh, you know, has a sick family member or a child. All these things have to be taken into consideration with scheduling. So an example of this would be, let's say Michelle as a child that has been sick. So she's been out for three days and she's returning to work on the fourth day. Do you want to schedule her at 7 a.m.? Mm -hmm. Why not? She's probably getting any sleep. Probably she's probably getting any sleep. Tired and she probably, she probably won't have the mindset to work. <laughs> Might not have the mindset to work. What else? Who's sick? The child, right? The child may not be better that day. So the child might not be better that day, right? What else? Why? Why else? Why might seven a.m. not be a good shift? Oh, she have to get the child somewhere. School or daycare? School. She she may need to wait to see if the child's gonna be well enough to go to school or not, right? So those are the types of things you have to consider when you're doing scheduling as well.
Now I'm talking about recruitment. These days, obviously, it's not too hard to recruit because a lot of people are looking for a job, right? But how can we be creative about our recruitment? We want creative people, right? So we need to have creative recruitment. Right? Mm -hmm. So if we were to think about some non-traditional, you know, we know that we see ads in the newspaper. You know, that's pretty traditional. What about some, uh, what are some non-traditional ways that we can do some recruiting? If we're in the HR, we're all in this HR department, all of us, even me, we're recruiting. How might we, if we are looking for top notch and we don't want the hospital down the street to get this person, what might we do that's a little more creative than your typical avenues of recruiting? What about social media? Is that not creative? Yeah. Social media, word of mouth. <laughs> Newspapers are kind of more so traditional. If we're thinking in terms of non-traditional Craigslist. <laughs> Craigslist. Oh my God. Craigslist about, will work. What about the community channel on TV? Community channel on TV, that'll work. That's pretty creative. What about having, I've seen um, some places have open house. Mm -hmm. Let them come to, to, to us. We just have the open house and we don't have to go out and get them. We let them come in and tell us, right? Um, some places will provide tuition assistance to try to help um, recruit people, which is a big thing now because a lot of people are trying to return to school. Mm -hmm. um, obviously scholarships mm -hmm. and internships are also um, things that will attract people. Pay. We know that will attract people, right? Um, you know, if, if this is our HR department, we have to do research to make sure that what we're offering is competitive in the market. Without the research, we may be offering 20,000 less than what other people are. That should never be the case. Mm -hmm. That would be a clear indicator of somebody not doing market research. <coughs> How do we do market research? You might know. Yeah, like it. I don't know. <laughs> check down the companies. How do we check them? Mm -hmm. The Department of Labor has. Okay. Labor. Department of Labor, they mm -hmm. um, release a survey, a new survey every year that lists uh, salaries for different areas. Um, in my previous work as a consultant, we did use the Department of Labor information a lot. Um, what else? Mm -hmm. Can we call? I used to have to call. It's kind of risky, but um, we call and if they didn't want to give us an exact number, we'd ask for a range. Well, like word of mouth, certain people working. Word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people lie. <laughs> <laughs> they do. You know, so you got to be careful with word of mouth. It's a good idea, but you know, you have to when you take that information in your mind, you have to know that it may not be a hundred percent sure. Because if I ask you how much you make. Are you going to be truthful with me, or are you going to push it up like $10,000? Oh, I didn't think about that. That's you know what I mean? Yeah. So. Uh, some places will offer um, certification and licensure as a recruitment effort, um, which is great for people, clinical staff, like nurses, LPNs, um, because it's required for them to have anyway. Um, so if the organization is willing to help assist them with paying for those fees, um, that's great. Um, pretty much every state is going to require that you know, a nurse or an LPN be licensed. Um, they also maintain records of people who may have abused um, drugs or substances um, within the hospital or health care organization or um, if they participated in any type of negligent or abuse. So if we're, we're hiring for LPNs, we probably should make sure that they haven't been involved in a lawsuit in another nursing home, right? Mm -hmm. Make sure that they, they weren't the one that didn't turn that resident when they were supposed to when they got bed sores, right? Mm -hmm. 
absenteeism and turnover. We can use this class as an example. Sometimes you guys come to class, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you feel like Ooh, that is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> was that a bad example? Yeah. No, I was just happy to have it, you know? But how do I how do I and how do we as managers, how do we how do we keep that down? Contact. Contact, right? I just said earlier that there was a classmate that I needed to contact because they haven't been here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, contact and follow up is key. You want to make sure that you have reached out to them to see it may be something totally out of their control, um, at, you know, for them not being there. Um, and as far as turnover, you can use the same thing. <coughs> um, you pretty much usually know when someone's unhappy. Um, you can usually tell when they may be looking for another job. Um, so what do you do in that situation? Communicate with them, but what do you say? Why? Mm. Why? Mm. What else? What can I do? What can I do to help, right? Mm -hmm. That should be the first thing you say. Mm -hmm. And then maybe why. No, you scare them into saying <laughs> why. I'm <laughs> done. Okay. All right. Um, I'll fire you right now. Um, and both of these things kind of tie hand in hand a lot of times in uh, some other good, uh, everything you guys said was great, but some other good ways to kind of gauge these things um, are to evaluate, especially if it's a new program um, or a new employee. You want to make sure that you're evaluating them, watching them, um, to see if there's anything that you're doing or they're doing that may be affecting that turnover or the absenteeism. And you obviously also want to assess staff satisfaction. I think that should be something that's done annually. Um, just like we do our patient satisfaction um, <coughs> surveys regularly, we should also be doing our own staff satisfaction surveys to make sure that they're happy. So why do people call out? Sick. Mm -hmm. They just don't care. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to work today. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Low morale. Family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Work. Right? Any others that I missed? No? Mm -hmm. All right, so how, how are we measuring? How do I measure? I take note of every time you all come in here and um, you know I have notes, I have dates, <coughs> so I know when you're here and when you're not here. So it's important that you keep some type of record, regardless of what it may be. Um, and here they give a formula that you can use if you want to calculate their rate of absenteeism. But regardless of what you do, the main key is that you're doing something to keep count. Because as a manager, we're going to be busy, so if you're not keeping notes of it, you're going to forget how many times we weren't there. Um, policies. It's important to have a written policy so that Ms. Burgess knows if she misses more than 20% of class, I can drop it. Um, without any policy, then you know, there's no expectation, right? There needs to be a clear distinction between excused and unexcused absences. How many times have you seen this happen? I've seen it happen where I wasn't sure if I went to jury duty, if I was going to be okay, or if I still needed to bring in a letter, or exactly what, what the policy was on that. So it needs to be a clear distinction between what's okay and what's not okay for me as far as coming in or missing work, right? We need to specify excessive absentees and the consequences. You know, we just talked about it. If you miss X amount of days, you're going to be fired. That needs to be clearly stated. Um, individual counseling kind of goes along with communicating with them. Have them come into your office. Sit them down. Talk to them um, privately so that you can fully understand what's the issue, what's the problem, why they're not coming in, why they're missing work. So turnover and retention. Mm -hmm. What happens when people quit? 
a number of people quit and the, the turnover is high. What happens to that organization once they're gone? You lose money every minute, every second that you know that someone's not there. When you think about the profit for the organization, it counts. Every second counts. What else are we? What else happens? Burnout. Burnout. People left behind get what? More work, right? Mm -hmm. At least in the interim until they find more people. Mm -hmm. Burnout. What else? Are the, are the people still there? Are they happy? No. No. no low morale. They're all low morale. They're all feeling overworked, right? Mm -hmm. Their pay isn't going up. Right. They're stressed out. Yeah. And the reputation is in question. Increased workload. Why did so many, you know, quit like that? Job security, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Low job security. So would that be a reality check for the company? It would. It wrong? definitely is. Um, a good HR department is keeping count of this stuff and a good HR department would be going back to these departments saying, do you realize that your turnover rate is 50%? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, they should be communicating that information back to the department so that they, you know, you know, with them being so busy, they may not realize that their turnover rate is that high. Um, but it's important for the HR department to communicate that so that they, wow, 50%. Mm -hmm. um, and it's better that they hear it from the HR mm -hmm. department than the administrator or the CEO or the president, um, because once it gets to that level, then it's going to be a huge issue. Um, and hopefully, these type of numbers are being relayed to them more than once a year, um, at least quarterly. I think, in my opinion, you should be reporting to your departments what your turnover rate is, so that they don't have to wait until the end of the year to try to fix it. Um, so you're absolutely right. Definitely is something that needs to be communicated down to the departments. Um, sometimes I've seen situations where, regardless of if it was their fault or not, the managers have been fired because the turnover was so high. <coughs> it could be, you know, the most efficient manager in the world, but for whatever reason, the turnover was high, and instead of continuing to lose employees, they just get rid of the manager. Um, so it's definitely a serious issue um, to, to consider when you're managing people in your department and they keep leaving. So we talked about costs. Uh, well, it's very important to measure exactly how much money you're losing because of turnover. There's hospitals and, and healthcare organizations that lose thousands and thousands of dollars, probably some that even lose millions of dollars because of their turnover. Um, and again, here, it's a, we talk about having monthly or quarterly rates rather than annually that can, can uh, zone in on those costs and those losses so that at the end of the year, we're not looking at a huge loss um, as a result of something that we could have been monitoring more often. Um, when we look at costs, we'll have direct costs and indirect costs as a result of turnover. Direct costs are going to be training, um, salary, the things that directly affect us. Our indirect costs are going to be over time, we talk about burnout, so we have less people doing more work, so they're obviously probably going to be working more hours, working overtime, so that's an indirect cost. But what if we have to, we don't have enough people left, so we have to call in staffing agencies to come in. Do you all know what the cost of staffing agencies is? It's, it's a lot. Um, it's typically, in my experiences, I've seen it'd be anywhere between $6 more to $15 more an hour, depending on the agency, depending on the position. Um, so staffing agencies are very expensive. A staffing agency is the last thing that a manager wants to do or should want to do because it's very, very expensive. Um, it's cheaper to pay overtime than to bring a staff, staffing agency. Mm -hmm. Um, other indirect costs. If we're burned out, we're tired, we're not going to be as productive. And then low morale. So how do we prevent this turnover? We have to develop our staff, right? How can we do that? We can do training. How else can we develop our staff? 
What about mentors, mentorships? Pairing them up with somebody else, an organization that can kind of take them under their wings and groom them and help them develop and uh, you know, tell them the things they need to be doing, whether that be signing up for this professional organization or doing this to your resume or whatever it may be. I think a lot of times, you know, pairing someone up with a mentor can help develop them. And doing things for them, showing that you care. Doing things for them, definitely. Showing them that you care. Um, you know, intangible things are always important when it comes to staff development. Um, even if it's just a, you know, as we talked about in my last class, a, a small thank you note. <coughs> just saying thank you for, for the things that you do. Mm -hmm. For no reason, just a, mm -hmm. an out of the blue thank you note. Definitely uh, can help develop the staff. So what types of skills specifically are we going to try to work with them um, in terms of staff development? Well, obviously technical skills. That might mean we're going to send you off to this class for three days so that you can learn or get certified in doing X, Y, Z. Um, coping skills. Obviously, um, if we're developing someone, we need to make sure that they are able to handle, if we're grooming someone to be a manager, we need to make sure that they not only technically have the skills to be a manager, but also emotionally have the skills to be a manager, right? Um, mission, vision, and values, always important. When we're developing staff, we need to make sure that those things are ingrained in them um, so that we know that the task that they're doing align with these things. Rules and policies and procedures. Most of us when we start a job, we get some type of handbook, right? It has all the rules in there. How often do we look at that? You get in, you know, right? You put it in the cabinet somewhere and you take it out, it has dust on it, right? You don't, you don't look at it. So if we're, if we're doing staff development, it has to be more than that. It has to be more than us just receiving that handbook and never looking at it again. It, um, it has to involve, um, whether it be regular in-service trainings or lunch and learns or seminars to review these policies and procedures or review any changes that might, might have been made. Um, the school's very good about um, emailing us whenever there's a change to the policies. Um, they send it to everybody who works here so that we all know what updates and changes have been made. Um, what about patient and family relations? How does that, how might that relate to staff development? Be on good term with them. Right? Be on good term with them. Any other way? I think when it comes to patient and family relations and staff development, Again, at the end of the day, we have to, to realize who our, our customers are, which are the patients, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when we're doing staff development and we're doing trainings and workshops, we have to always make sure that we are involving the patient in our discussions and their family and the reason that we're there. And that ties into our social responsibility. Our ultimate social responsibility is to improve the wellness and the health of the community, right, or of the patients. And so when we're, when we're doing staff development, we have to always make sure that we tie in these two to whatever it is that we're doing. So we're developing the staff. We've told them what they, what they need to do. We've given them the skills they need to do it. But we still have to be able to measure it, right? and that's where our performance appraisal comes in to key. Um, have any of you all heard of management by objectives before? Mm -hmm. Those of you who are doing co-ops, that would be very similar to your MLOs, right? Um, and basically, these are your objectives, your expectations. Um, these are all the things that should be included in the performance appraisal. <coughs> um, you should uh, be assessing the training needs, so when I used to receive um, appraisals, one of the questions always was, do you have the resources you need to do your job? 
Um, and I think it's a great, a great question because for whatever reason, you may, ha you may receive a poor appraisal, but that may be because your computer only works on Tuesdays. There may be other reasons why you can't do your job the way that you need to do it. And so assessing the trainees is important because you want to make sure that um, they have no excuse to say that, well, I didn't have, you know, these resources to do my job to the best of my ability. Um, obviously, you also want to assess the performance, um, actually see how they're doing, um, if they've accomplished the task that they were hired to do, and then rewards. Everybody likes rewards, right? Yeah. No? I can take back the extra credit assignment. Mm -hmm. I like rewards. I love rewards. Oh, you love rewards. <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, so rewards for employees um, and the managers and supervisors um, are all tied or should be tied to staff development as well. Where is that extra credit at? The Sunday, Sunday, next one look I called too. I can't find it. Module six. She said I missed on the next module because I had an I, I email to the Module six. Yeah. Um, it's under there because that's what it's actually do. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's under Model 6. Um, so teams. We actually just talked about teams in my last class also. Um, does anybody know what a self-managed work team is? The name kind of, kind of explains it. Minimum. Minimum uh, overseeing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Very little oversight. Um, a lot of times they'll meet on their own or they may have impromptu meetings. Sometimes um, some of the best meetings happen in the break room or at the water cooler. Mm -hmm. um, so um, obviously self-managed work teams, like you said, do very little with the manager, but they should still be following up mm -hmm. with whoever the manager is. So if they meet once a week, somebody should be sending an email to the manager saying, met today, this is what we discussed, this is what we um, came to a conclusion about, or we came to a conclusion about nothing, the meeting was a waste, we got in a fight. Whatever the status may be, there should be some type of communication between the team and the management. Even if the manage manager isn't uh, micromanaging them or standing over them, there still needs to be some type of communication. So if we're working hard to make these types of teams effective, we should have a charter. Does anybody know what a team charter is? When I was uh, in school, we, for every group project, and I'm considering doing this with you guys too, but I haven't. For every group project, we had to do a team charter. And basically, the team charter would say, this is the purpose for us being a team. This is what we're here to accomplish. Um, this is how we're going to accomplish it. This is how we're going to handle any conflicts that we may have. Um, this is going to be the team leader. So basically list all the, the uh, expectations of the team, the goals, the purpose of being a team. And it kind of serves as a guide. So if something goes wrong, they can go back to the charter and say, oh, this is what we said we would do if there was a conflict. Or this is what we said we would do if some, uh, you know, one of the team members didn't hold up their end of the bargain. So, um, charters can be very useful in helping teams stay in line so it's and more stay like focused. An organizer person. I'm sorry. Trying to organize the whole project. Would that be an organizer <coughs> charter? Um. Well, it's obviously a written document, mm -hmm. and it kind of serves. It should be something that's done at the very beginning of the, the group. Once you know who your team members are, before you start doing anything else, you should do your charter first. Do that, establish that, and, when, and after you do that, then you can start on the project. But what we used to have to do is, we used to have to establish the charter, and not just establish it, we had to turn it into our professors. So that they could see what the charter was, and then if something did go wrong, they would have the charter and say, well, your charter says that you're supposed to do this. Um, how else can we make these teams effective? Obviously, we need to have clear goals that are measurable. There's a difference between just setting a goal and then setting a goal that's measurable. You know, I could say a goal for me was to be a great professor, a great instructor for this year, for this semester. Okay, that's a goal, but how do I measure that? There's no way for me to measure that, right? But if I say that 
I want to be a great professor this semester and I want that to be indicated through surveys, through mm -hmm. um, you know, surveys from students, mm -hmm. that I can measure, right? Mm -hmm. Because once you guys do the surveys and I can look at the surveys and say, well, according to the students, I'm not that great of an instructor. Oh, so you have to be specific yeah, exactly. to what you're saying. Right. Okay. You have to be specific and there has to be some type of way to measure um, you know, what you're doing. You know, if we're thinking in terms of parenting and you say, I'm going to pick my child up every day from daycare. Okay, great goal. But how are you going to measure that? But if you say, I'm going to pick my child up every day from daycare on time by 430, that we can measure, right? So, when you're setting your goals and your teams, you need to make sure that there's some type of way to measure it. So, if we're thinking in terms of your own teams, with your assignments, you know, some of the goals may be that everybody's going to have their part done by this date, instead of just saying everybody's going to do their part and we're going to finish it. But if you say that everybody's going to do their part and have it done by this date, then that's a little bit more measurable. Um, how else can teams be effective? Well, everybody in the team's gotta be different, more than likely, right? Mm -hmm. So what we need to do to make the team most effective is to recognize everybody's strengths and weaknesses and match them accordingly. If we know that, are you confirming? If we know that she's a great writer, but she's not very good at PowerPoint, Will we tell her to do the PowerPoint in our group? No. no. <laughs> Why not? She really wants to do the PowerPoint. But like she, she really writes good. She really like that's she really wants to do that. I think PowerPoint was good. Shut up. <laughs> right? So so you know, I, I use that as an example is that you have to know where everybody's strengths are and make sure that they're doing that. Um, and, and and kind of capitalizing on the things that they're good at. How else can these teams be effective? Team leaders, right? Mm -hmm. You can have a, a great group of people, but if the leader is not as great, how well do you think the outcome is going to be? May not be that great, right? <laughs> so counseling. If we go back to our example of us all being in a, working in the HR department together, we have to realize that we probably all at some point are going to do some counseling, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, if we're doing our job right and we're not just letting people walk out of the door. <clears throat> um, so hopefully, most of these counseling sessions will be somewhat informal. I think that people tend to be more comfortable and more relaxed if it's informal versus formal counseling. What might make it informal? Not in the office. Not in the office. Okay, that's a great example. What else? <clears throat> the way you speak to a person? The way you speak to a person, body language, even position, even if we're not in the office. But if I, if we're not in the office, I'm counseling you, is this going to be informal? Or what about if I'm sitting here? Which is more informal? This one. Right. So even down to body language and position, um, those type of things might affect um, the counseling and how it's informal versus informal. What about... Let's talk about job security. How comfortable would someone be in counseling if they feel like their job is in jeopardy? Uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to want to talk to you. They're not going to want to disclose any information that they may know, right? If we think in terms of coaching, how, how different is coaching from counseling? It's pretty much the same, right? No? How's it different? When I think about coaching, it's basically trying to push someone to just, to improve. It's like when there's a coach, like in basketball, soccer, I mean, it's, try to relate it to 
to be, I guess, <coughs> to push them a little to do what is necessary and would be counseling. Because counseling is more like a, just be able to talk to somebody and understand them, but understanding the coaching, I think, is like more of a pushing forward to trying to get what you want from the staff. Okay. You agree? I mean, I don't just because I, I mean, I coach, but I mean, I, I, so tell I mean, I see what she's saying, but like with me, I guess because I just deal with, she's a 24, but cackling cheery, um, and they all females, <laughs> but I mean, to me, I'm, I'm more of a, of a counselor, more of a mentor for them, even though, I mean, with what we do, you do want them to be good at what they do. We do, you know, strive and we push for that, but at the same time, you know, it's, <coughs> I don't know. It's not pushing, though, to me. What we do for them is not pushing. It's something to better them and whatnot. To me, it's not a push. Or okay, I can. I, I think I can agree with both both of your opinions. I think um, counsel counseling typically seems to come on the back end, and is usually as a result of something. Um, whereas coaching can kind of happen at any point. It can happen. I can coach you if you're doing nothing wrong. I may be coaching you because I want you to keep going and keep it up. Or I can coach you because you're not doing a good job, you're doing a poor job, and I want you to get better. With counseling, I don't think typically you counsel people if they're on the right page, unless there's an outside issue that just is clearly affecting them. Um, typically, it's more on the back end after something's already happened, or after they're not coming into work, after, um, you know, they missed three appointments with you or something like that. It's the best part of HR, right? The discipline, right? Mm -hmm. The most unfavorite part. Um, obviously, disciplining is going to be more formal than counseling. So if we go back to our example here, probably shouldn't sit here right here right, to discipline you, right? Mm -hmm. You might think I'm just joking around. Right. right? Um, I probably need to sit here so we can have eye contact. Right. You definitely know that you know there's a uh, there's more of a barrier between us mm -hmm. versus me sitting there, right? right. Um, and so that's important to know that there is a difference and that there should be a difference because while you may counsel someone and develop a rapport with them and a relationship with them, if for whatever reason it comes to the point where you need to discipline them, you can't necessarily talk to them the same way that you may have talked to them when you were counseling. Because you do want to make sure that they understand that there is a level of authority that you have as a manager and that you have to carry out this discipline, whatever it may be. Um, what are some common problems? Attendance, obviously. What about dishonesty? No one ever think about that, right? But it's very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, work performance, you're just not performing well. Behavioral problem. Beha is that a big deal? Yeah. But yeah. working with adults. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Attitude. <laughs> Doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, People say it all the time, like, oh, teaching adults should be so easy. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty much the same. They got a mm -hmm. set mind, you know what I mean? Yeah. With adults, you can't really change their outlook, especially a kid. You could with a kid because you still, their mind's still young and they still fresh. But with an adult, their mindset is just like, nope, that's it. That's <laughs> so, you're, you're, so you're arguing that this probably happens more yeah. in a work setting it than does. a school setting. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. okay. Adults that are older than the yeah. that are teaching you too, they get mad. They have that mindset that you're younger. Right. Mm -hmm. I had somebody do that. Before. Exactly. All right, so we've talked about discipline and how we have to rule with the iron fist, but it's important for us to recognize that you can discipline in a positive manner. Um, a great example of this that someone once taught me is that when you have to discipline someone, um, try to start out with something positive. Um, you know, you're a great nurse, you're great with the patients. However, you haven't been coming in on time. You know what I mean? You want to try to point out that there's some positive there somewhere within that person rather than just tell them everything they're doing wrong. They, are, they already know they're in trouble. So that's already one thing. But to just continue to tell them only negative stuff is probably not going to be very <coughs> helpful. So 
you want to emphasize um, correcting the issue and being more positive rather than just focusing on all the things they did wrong and what's going to happen to them because they did it wrong. So instead of just saying, you haven't been coming in on time, you should also be talking about, do we need to change your schedule? Because you're not coming in on time, do we need to change your shift to 12 p.m. instead of 7 a.m.? What can we do to, to correct this, rather than me just punishing you for not coming in? Um, you know, you may punish the employee, but um, you should always have the objective of correcting that behavior. So if for whatever reason they can't change their shift, you still need to have that conversation with the employee that says, how are we gonna change this? Before you leave out of this room, let's talk about your plan and how you're going to make sure that you come to work on time tomorrow. Um, and the last thing is very important. Whatever solution you come to, should be something that's mutual. If, you know, we're talking, we're using the example of coming in on time and I say, let's change your shift to 12 p.m. That might sound like a great solution to me, but it may not be a great uh, solution for, for that employee. So you need to make sure that it's something that's mutual and that that employee is okay with whatever the solution may be that you proposed. Otherwise, what's gonna keep happening? Same thing's gonna keep happening, right? So obviously, you can't hire someone and then they come in through, uh, come in late and we fire them, right? Mm -hmm. It has to be a, a progressive stage. So the first thing is typically a ver verbal warning. You came in late today. I saw you come in late today. Let's try to get here on time. Second thing is typically something in writing. You came in late yesterday. You came in late today. I have to write you up. Here's your copy. You know, this is documentation that says that you violated XYZ policy. Fine. For whatever reason, this person just cannot come to work on time. So the next step is going to be another written warning that's going to be the final one. I'm writing you up again, but this is it. Um, or you may get suspended. Why don't you take a week off, figure out why you're not coming in on time, and then come back. And then the last state would be, you're fired. But you've given them three chances, right? So this is the correct way to do it. It doesn't always happen this way. You may hear of some examples where people just get outright fired for doing whatever. But if we're trying to be an effective HR department, this is how it should flow. And there should always be an appeal system. While you may have plenty of documentation as to why this person should get fired for whatever reason. They may still want to appeal your decision. So you need to have a system in place prepared for that if somebody comes back to you and says, okay, great, but I want to appeal this. And we're going to stop today right there because we are out of time.